Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight on our news. The father of another teenager gunned down in the streets of the capital speaks up. The transport minister addresses concerns about a barge that ran aground in Long Island. The tourism minister says no disrespect to the Bahamas Christian Council, but when it comes to gaming, he's got a job to do. Our news is brought to you by Alive, the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Vonnie Tude. Topping news tonight as yet another young life was lost to gun violence. The father of a 15-year-old killed last night described him as the type of guy you had to kill because he's not going to back down. The shooting incident happened just after 8 p.m. on Prison Lane. Georgie O'Bain has the details. The father of the 15-year-old boy that lost his life here on Prison Lane last night is blaming the educational system for why his son met his untimely death and describes his son as a boy who never backs down. The murder scene was just a few feet away from police headquarters. Police were on the scene last night trying to put together the pieces of the latest homicide, dusting for fingerprints and collecting bullets from a vehicle that the 15-year-old victim was standing next to when he was gunned down. Sure after eight that a juvenile male was standing in this area when a dark Honda vehicle pulled up a um, lone male alighted from the vehicle and fired several shots at him um, the male was juvenile the victim was rushed to hospital um, the driver of the vehicle sped off immediately afterwards the victim, identified by his father as 15-year-old Anthony Wellington Francis, is a student of C.I. Gibson Senior High School. Wellington Francis said his only son was caught off guard as he walked to the corner store, telling our news they noticed a black Honda Accord circling the area. Hey. See the type of guy my son is? You love to kill him. See, you know, going back down. You know? And like... I don't know if he's waiting because he was sent to the shop and the person would do that to him didn't know he was coming to the shop. They probably was following her. I wouldn't say, but the car passed a couple of times. It's a black Honda, 2008 four door with a gray thing on the window. A gray uh, duct tape on a small window. Yeah, we saw it pass a couple of times. The grieving father says gang violence is ruining the lives of young men. After the shooting, the person ran out, the car ran down the hill. But the car come back down. And what's so bad about it, the police stopped the car. You know, if it's a shooting in the area and you see police and you hear the shot, you're the bottom hill, you come up. And Honda's been a lot and a lot of shooting. How you can let the Honda go to the corner? He puts his detain that Honda until you find out what's going on. Francis tells us that he tried to get his son into another school, fearing that Anthony would be forced to interact with others from rival areas. It's just like in prison. Do you have segregation, different gangs? School's the same way. If you if you if you vibing with somebody in the school, why would you force him to go to and said for him to get an education, you have to go to that's the only school he get to go to. That ain't right. But if it was their kids, it wouldn't happen. Or their friend kids. Since school opened, Francis said his son went a total of three times, and each time he got into fights. But every morning he come from my heart. He come me out. My son been to school three times from school open. He went, he went to CI. First time he been one day, second day, the third day he been in a fight with the, been in a fight with the, the school and the police and all that. So I said, well, I'm not gonna let him go back. The owner of the yard where the fatal shooting took place is 85-year-old Ruth Ward, who says the reality of losing so many young men brings tears to her eyes. I think about it this morning. I think about it so hard this morning till I started crying and say. That's a couple of uh, weeks ago, an eight, an eight years old child. He could, hallelujah, he can be in no safer place than his mother dining room doing his homework. See, them kind of things to take your, take your life from your body. I don't know why our young people today don't do better. Don't do better. Then the yeah. children don't listen. And some of the parents are so adaptable with the children. If they'll do better with these children, we'll have a better nation, a better country. This incident brings the country's murder count to 114 for the year. Reporting for R News, I'm Georgie O'Bain.
Dr. Chaz Belhanna, director of the National Anti-Drug Secretariat, partnered with the University of the Bahamas and the Royal Bahamas Police Force to conduct and compile a study called Solutions to the Country's Murder Problem. This study has three main objectives. First, chapters one through six presented a descriptive analysis of murder incidents that occurred within the Commonwealth of the Bahamas between 2010 and 2015, totaling some 700 and 19 murders. During the study period, a host of variables including incidents, victims, suspects, motives, detection rates, and conviction rates were collected and analyzed from case files and local criminal justice databases. According to Dr. Hanna, some of the more interesting findings during the study include that when compared to the United States, the Bahamas' detection rate is higher. The Bahamas' murder rate ranks 13th out of a survey of 142 nations. Number two, murders are heavily concentrated in communities which fall below the average household income line. <clears throat> Number three, persons involved in criminal activity are more likely to be murdered than persons who are not involved in criminal activity. Number four, 19% of murder victims were on bail. Number five, 39% of persons charged with murder were on bail. The study also lists seven strategies to reduce the murder rate. The murder reduction strategy is comprised of seven key action points. Number one, punish the most violent criminal offenders. Number two, stop illegal guns from entering the Bahamas. Number three, the establishment of a DNA forensic laboratory. Number four, dismantling criminal gangs. Number five, dissuading youths from using drugs. Number six, increase economic opportunities for at-risk youth. And number seven, increase educational achievement. Remediation efforts are now underway to contain a fuel leak off Gray's Long Island. That's according to Minister of Transport and Local Government Frankie Campbell, who revealed in Parliament today that the barge ran aground on Saturday. Jasmine Brown has that. Campbell told parliamentarians this morning that a team has been dispatched to Long Island to assess the situation there. Mr. Speaker, information re received from Long Island on Saturday morning was that a barge, a uh, fully loaded barge, was seen drifting in the northeastern section um, near to Gray's Long Island. After investigation, it was found that this was a barge that had broken away during Hurricane Irma. Uh, or shortly thereafter. According to Campbell, the barge that was carrying hurricane relief supplies from the United States to Anguilla ran aground on Saturday. On board the barge was heavy machinery, cell phone towers, utility poles, bucket trucks, a crane, and approximately 7,000 gallons of fuel and various other supplies. I'm just filled with a mixture of frustration and rage. All of this could have been avoided. Not like hypothetically, if someone had gotten here in time, maybe we were freaking here to prevent this from happening. Footage of the barge on the Long Island shoreline has made the rounds on social media. Several large containers that fell into the water are also seen floating around the barge as waves wash oil ashore. Campbell says while the barge ran ashore on Saturday, it appears the cargo did not fall into the water until Monday. The owner of the barge was subsequently identified and there was communication. Uh, the owner of the barge came to the Bahamas. I think on Sunday and subsequently went to Long Island on Monday and up to Monday afternoon while there was still some concern and apparent distress all indications were that the matter was still under control but um, sometime during the evening last evening last night um, and between this morning um, I think the weather conditions worsened the cargo that was on the barge is now in the water in Long Island and there is indication that there might be some diesel that was in containers on the barge now in the water. Opposition leader Philip Brave Davis said the people of Long Island were furious and questioned government's response time. But the transport minister told the House he was awaiting reports from the port department and others who were dispatched to the island. All the relevant authorities um, 
met this morning and they are now en route to Long Island um, to join in with the locals who have already started to take some um, remediation action and we're satisfied that the matter is being addressed and we await the reports from the environmentalists and the individuals from the port department. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Opposition leader Philip Davis slamming Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist in Parliament today, asserting he was out of order when he asserted that the Christie administration diverted more than $40 million to buy an election win. He also called for the matter to be investigated by the House of Assembly's Committee on Privilege. I speak for myself when I claim injury in this matter and ask that this matter be investigated by the Committee on Privileges. Let me say that this member of Parliament was not a party to any untoward scheme or any scheme to, to, at all to divert or appropriate sums of money that were allocated for, for and towards the expenses of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. For the record, we, we remind the public and the minister that when funds come into the government, they all go into the consolidated fund. In a statement last week, Turnquest said the PLP obtained a resolution to borrow $150 million in hurricane relief. But he suspected the former government instead diverted $40 million plus for unauthorized expenditure in a vain effort to buy an election win. Davis said Turnquest's claim suggests that the former government is guilty of a criminal offense. This statement, apart from being untrue, is out of order for a parliamentarian to make an allegation which is a clear attack on the integrity of myself and the member for Angleston. House Speaker Halston Moultrie said he will examine those claims made and make a determination on whether the matter should be referred to the committee. As public discussion over the prospects of a national lottery continue, Tourism Minister Dionisio Diaguilar says he knows church leaders will disagree with him. He said that's their job and religious leaders must allow him to do his. Kai Joaquin tells us more. Diagler said he fully respects the views of the Bahamas Christian Council, but as the Minister of Tourism, when it comes to gaming, he's got a job to do. And I understand where they're coming from, and I get it. But that's not a practical solution. Tourism Minister Dionisio Diagler responding to Bahamas Christian Council President Bishop Delton Fernander, who said he was shocked that another government minister has come out in support of the creation of a Bahamas National Lottery. He said the council expected the Minutes administration to either tighten the existing legislation or repeal the law. This after Diagler said he would do what he must to see that a national lottery in the Bahamas is established. We now have gaming on the ground and we have to deal with it. So what's the outcome? We can't outlaw it completely because we were in that situation and it didn't work. So there has to be some sort of compromise. I intend to be practical. I understand their religious point of view and the view from which they're coming from. And if I was the good bishop, I would say exactly the same thing. But I'm not the good bishop. And so I have to come up with a practical solution. St. Agnes Anglican Church Rector Iran Flea Brown last week encouraged religious leaders to stay out of the gaming discussion and focus on their congregation. The Christian Council had campaigned against the previous government's plan to establish a national lottery, and so did the FNM while in opposition. The country in turn voted against a national lottery as well. However, now that the FNM is the governing party, a national lottery could become a reality. I know, I know, I, the people did vote no, but the previous government decided not to abide by that vote. We are now in, and we have to uh, deal with the current situation on the ground. When I voted for the referendum, personally I voted for the referendum, I've always said that I've never run away from that. My belief was that it was against the law and it was pervasive. Everybody was doing it, so outlawing it is not solving it. My position is it's better to tax and to heavily regulate. That's a much better situation to be in because if you outlaw it, they just go underground and do it anyway. Whatever government decides to do, the tourism minister says he's certain there will be pushback, calling it a classic example of you can't please everyone. Members of the Christian Council have always told me, look, you do what you got to do as an elected official, and we do what we got to do as members of the cloth. Reporting for our news, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Members of Parliament beginning debate today on a bill for an act to establish the office of an independent director of public prosecutions. Under the bill, certain functions performed by the Attorney General will be transferred to the DPP. Member of Parliament for Elizabeth, Dr. Dwayne Sands, said the Minister administration is moving the Bahamas in the right direction. Member of Kalani, I applaud you. Go long. Go long. Go long. Go long. Go long. <laughs> because while the other side 
may love the status quo. I believe that in your effort to go long, that we will see justice flow like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. Elizabeth supports this resolution. Opposition leader Philip Davis said the legislation is far from modern and insisted the DPP already has the power spoken of in that bill. He even suggested that the former FNM government had a more progressive bill back in 2002. You're establishing something that exists already. Despite his comments, Davis says he will vote in support of the bill. Still to come on our news, BPL reviews its staffing complement how this could impact workers. So stay with us.